So this is a talk that is geared for prostate cancer patients. And it's going to divide it into two sections. The first part is about urinary function, principally continence issues following prostate cancer treatment. And the second half will be about sexual dysfunction, principally erectile dysfunction. We're going to apply all forms of treatment for prostate cancer to this talk. Some specific references, but this applies to radical prostatectomy, whether done open laparoscopically. We'll talk a bit about HIFU. We'll talk a bit about the robot. If you have any questions about that, I will mention that in the second part of the talk. So this will apply to all consequences of treatment, although some issues are more common with one rather than the other. So the quality of life we're talking about here is principally that of urinary control and sexual function. So we call the first part live life dry. So urinary incontinence, and this is not rocket science, basically it's defined as the objective demonstration of involuntary loss of urine consequent to bladder or sphincter dysfunction. And we're going to put a difference on that because there are some people have one, some people have other, and some people have a combination. So we need to explain and maybe make you understand if you've got the problem, maybe what you've got and how to approach the problem. So when you talk about urinary incontinence, and this is basically referring to the control muscle issue, it's basically like a tap that's got a faulty washer. It drip, drip, drips all the time, just like you need a proper washer in your tap, you need a proper control muscle to function to keep the urine in your bladder. So when a patient leaks urine, there are different types of incontinence. There's stress incontinence. That's something that was or is often thought to be the domain of the female after childbirth where somebody leaks urine during physical activity such as lifting, exercising, sneezing, and coughing. And that implies, generally speaking, a problem with the pelvic muscles which we're going to address. Urge incontinence is different. It's leakage associated, it's associated with the overwhelming need to urinate when you got to go, you got to go. And a lot of people with this type of problem know where every washroom is between Hamilton and Toronto or at the mall, they know where every washroom is. And there are some people that have mixed incontinence, men and women combined, and we'll look at how to approach it. And total incontinence is the real faulty washer where things just run out like a tap, constantly drip or constantly run out. So we need to look at what happens, and basically what happens is your bladder is a storage organ. It's supposed to be able to store urine of a particular volume. Everybody's got a different volume. The sphincter or control muscle is located outside at the neck of the bladder, in the prostate, and just outside the prostate. And it is what keeps the urine in your bladder until you want to go. It wraps around the urine passage or the urethra. And when things are working properly, that control muscle doesn't open up until your bladder contracts and you have to pee. And we're going to look at what happens if the control muscle doesn't do that or can't do that. Incontinence. And we're going to address particularly prostate surgery. Now, radical prostatectomy and other forms of treatment of prostate cancer cause it, but principally it's the surgical treatment and patients who have the standard procedure for the term BPH or prostate enlargement, there is a small incidence of incontinence after that procedure. And there are other types of pelvic surgery, spinal cord injuries, and neurologic disease, which can lead to various types of incontinence, but we're, of course, going to concentrate on the first one. Well, and this is looking at incontinence in general. A lot of people who leak, whether it's after prostate surgery or even other causes of incontinence, there is a reluctance to talk about it, to talk to their doctor about it. Well, 
Just like the second thing we'll talk about is we'll show you with erectile dysfunction, you are not alone if you have a urinary leakage problem. Um, and at least two million men in the world have got some sort of incontinence or leakage, including prostate cancer treatment patients, and it's, that's probably an underestimate because it's old data. And prostate incontinence, pro surgery after for the prostate, various reports lead to 1 to 31 percent. If you look at raw numbers, though, if you really want to be frank, probably about 1 in 10 patients that undergoes surgical treatment for prostate cancer still has a urinary control problem one year out. Because, as we'll see, it may get better as time goes on. There's ways to make it better. But about 10% would fit into the group who have a permanent problem with leakage. And we'll talk about the various grades of incontinence and what can be offered. We talked about, well, reluctance. Um, people are embarrassed to talk about it. A lot of people don't know there are things that can be done, including after prostate cancer surgery. There's a lot of lack of information, although now with computers, people can go on the computer and look up things. It's really easy to buy absorbent products and just forget about it, buy them and just not talk about it. And one of the issues is, is doctors don't ask about the problem. And we're going to address that more specifically when I get into the second part of the talk. But I don't do prostate cancer surgery anymore myself, but I look after these two problems all the time. And I get notes from the surgeons of people I've referred to them to be treated. And all the notes ever say is, Patient's PSA is 0.06, I'll see him in six months. There is very rarely a reference, is the patient having urinary problems or is the patient having erectile dysfunction? Why don't doctors ask, people who do prostate surgery ask, and I'm going to sound biased and my colleagues may jump, well, don't ask because I'm not going to say they don't care. Some of them don't want to admit that there's a problem following surgery, etc. But some of them are so focused on cancer cure that these quality of life issues become secondary uh, to their reevaluation of the patient. So, why do we treat it? Well, this is obvious. We avoid negative feelings such as embarrassment, discomfort, isolation, anger, and depression. If you don't have to wear pads and you don't wet yourself, you can return to your usual lifestyle. You can go out for walks, you can go golfing, you can go to the gym. You're more dignified if you're not wearing pads and smell of urine. We can relate urinary incontinence into lack of sexual relations and we'll talk about that when we get to erectile dysfunction. Obviously, there's money saved on protective garments if we can make people dry. And generally speaking, it's an improvement in the general quality of life, what this is all about. And this is what people complain about. Extra laundry, smell, extra expense, skin irritation, disturbed sleep. So a lot of this stuff are things that people often adapt to. But why should you adapt to it? Because we can basically make it so we can reduce this to almost 0% if the patient wants. But once again, when we talk about the incontinence issue and we talk about even when we get to sexual function, the need for treatment is based on bother for the patient. So if the patient is not bothered and willing to live with a certain problem. Uh, we can explain to them what we have to offer, but if they're happy to live with it, they, they can live with it. Because sometimes people say, well, the treatment is worse, the cure is worse than the disease. But um, in these two things we're talking about, we'll try and show you that the 
cure is better than having the condition. Okay, so what are our management options? These are for people with incontinence. What can you be offered? Well, there are various pads and diapers you can get, medication, and we'll talk about certain devices. And the last thing we're going to talk about is surgical treatment, which is sort of like the keynote of what we want to talk about once we go through all of the other treatments that are available may have been tried on patients. The first thing to understand, this applies in Canada, there is no approved medication for stress incontinence in men. So if you have a leaky washer following your prostate cancer treatment, there is no medication that works, nor that is approved. And whether there will ever be one, I can't tell you, but certainly there is nothing right around the corner coming into clinical practice to treat this condition.